Hey, everybody. Welcome to the Fire It Up with CJ show. We have Evan Alexander and Karen Newell here, and they are talking about their book, Living in a Mindful Universe. And in the previous segment, we were talking about how um, Karen and Evan met and um, how um, how um, sound brainwave and meditation is, is, is one of the ways that you've been able to kind of experience again the same near-death experiences that you had um, um, when you when you died a long time ago. <laughs> so I want to um, ask, um, we were talking about oneness. I'm not sure if everyone understands that idea. And you shared with us the experience of being in oneness, feeling unconditional love, kindness, a sense of value and importance. But what is oneness from a scientific perspective? Um, or from you know a spiritual perspective, how would you describe what it is? Well, I, I would certainly say that um, in my own experience, one of the most important aspects was coming into that in the NDE, uh, that core realm that I just described, um, where I became one with that source of pure awareness. And uh, remember that where that happened was a realm where all of four dimensional space time had completely collapsed down. The higher dimensional multiverse was there as this complex overseer for teaching. And I was in a realm of eternity and infinity. Um, so the words to try and describe it really don't exist. Um, mm -hmm. And I can just kind of give these vague kind of uh, indicators um, uh, of it from that viewpoint. But the reality is that love, that oneness is something that so many indie ears have experienced and come back with is a raw experience of existence. But then when you get out to the modern science of consciousness and the 12 years since my NDE and studying it, what you find is the notion of oneness emerges uh, uh, from some of the deepest uh, and most profound uh, evidence. Um, quantum physics is the most proven field in the history of science. One third of our modern economy you know, GPS, cell phones, computers, televisions, all the microelectronics, every bit of that is due to the success of quantum physics. And yet at the deepest layers of those experiments in quantum physics is a profound mystery that's been there for more than a century now. Uh, and the founding fathers of quantum physics, like Erwin Heis, um, Heis, uh, Werner Heisenberg, <coughs> Erwin Schrodinger, um, Wolfgang Pauli, um, John von Neumann, et cetera, they all uh, recognized that experiments in the fundamental nature of the subatomic world around us revealed that there was consciousness observing it that went beyond anything that might be derivative from physical matter. I mean, that's essentially mm. what it boils down to. So right at the core mm. of quantum physics and trying to make sense of this over the last uh, century, and there's a very long discussion that we don't have any time to go into, and it's very complex, it concerns progression of the experiments in quantum physics, but we've gotten to a point now where those experiments point to a reality for objective idealism. That is that fundamentally this universe works from a mental layer there of top-down causality. Uh, and that is something that um, uh, we talk about in Living in a Mindful Universe, uh, explore all that, but the but the deep and profound reality from this field of science of quantum physics is oneness, that there is really one mind in this universe, and that's what we all share. Uh, and that's where uh, it gets very exciting for the individual. I think, Karen, I want to talk to you about, you had mentioned, um, <laughs> and it said one mind, you're like, and one heart. <laughs> <laughs> Why the interjection and why is the heart important in oneness? Well, I want to just mention, uh, I'll absolutely get to that, but, but I want to just respond to what Evan just said, because this was very much along the lines of conversations we would have when we first met. He would tell me how science, the revolution of science, how they've discovered this amazing thing. And I said, this is not new. This is not new information. And often we point to the Chinese who have their set of metaphysics, you know, the yin yang and the and the Tao. And then we point to the Indian tradition who has the Hindus, the Om, the oneness. But the Western 
tradition also has a deep esoteric uh, lineage that starts with oneness and that we have one mind. It started uh, Egypt and then moved through all these esoteric practices uh, through the practice of alchemy, uh, all of those principles have to do with there's one mind and we as mental sentient beings have an ability to influence. So this is not a new concept, but with a Western world so dependent on, you know, science telling us what is real, it's incredibly important for science to catch up with these sort of esoteric concepts and reunite this science and spirituality. But the reason I bring in heart is because so many of us think that our, our mind, our thoughts, our decisions, our choices, that intellect is what's really driving us. And in the end, there's a whole other part of us that is more of a, a, a feeler, a uh, intuitive knower, things like that, that we tend to put aside and dismiss but we can know so, so much more when we can kind of come into the heart and open ourselves from a more non-linguistic center, right? So we, where we don't have any words to sort of define and limit us, when we can get into that heart center, that's where we find that there's a lot of feelings and knowings and intuitive and love is there as well. Now, when you first go in to start paying attention to the heart, it's not necessarily what you find because so many of us have suppressed old emotional trauma. It's not necessarily serious, but maybe from a breakup, even when we were younger, we hold those kind of hurts inside. We haven't necessarily learned to process them, but those feelings, those sort of suppressed feelings are playing a role that unconscious mind is also playing a role. And much of that can be found, I believe, by placing attention on the heart. And mm. so that's why when people talk about one mind, it's very intellectual. And we need to remember that emotions are a part of that intellect and they go together. The heart emits an electromagnetic field. The electricity must have the magnetism in order to function. And so it's similar to that. The mind and the heart work together integrally. Okay, I had, um, I'm so excited to talk to you because I just finished um, two retreats. One, which was, I, I literally experienced the thing that you're talking about. And this was actually from an Eastern perspective. It was a Maha Mudra. And with that um, practice, you calm down the mind and you get your mind to focus on the breath. And when your mind focuses on the breath, you actually don't even focus on that. You just focus on the felt sensory experience of the breath and you get your mind to go offline. And so the first experience, because I didn't know what to expect, I just kind of listened to the instructions and felt this sense of oneness. I think I've I've experienced different flavors of it, but it's the very first time that I truly experienced like, oh my gosh, this, this has been here all along. You know, I'm in my basement and I'm looking out this like dingy little window and I just see this like, oh, there's beauty all around us. Has this been here all along? Like what? And yeah, then I looked and I could too. see like all a retinue of people around me that have been there presumably all along. And I was just crying and throughout the whole workshop, I was crying, which may, makes I'm connecting perhaps to the thing that you're saying where my mind was finally like, you know, dimmed a little bit, maybe not fully, but then my heart was like healing because it's finally like, hello, finally, you're listening to me. <laughs> so it's just like shedding tears of trauma of being, you know, yes, of yes, all the guarding. And then, because I kept on saying, why am I crying throughout this whole workshop? I'm usually not someone who cries a lot. And I was just crying and maybe which is why I was crying, but I was crying the entire time during the workshop. And then the pivotal thing was this huge experience where I felt that oneness. And then the second workshop, of course, I came grasping at <laughs> watching that same experience from the first time. And my mind was like, okay, would you, you know, and it just got involved in the whole meditation and 
guess what? I didn't experience anything yeah. that I did before. So I wanted to talk to you a little bit about the mind and how we can, in, in a lot of ways, when I just focus on the sensation of it, but it's the desire to want to go back, which I'm sure I've heard a lot of people from near-death experiences, they grasp it like, Heck, if I can get that profound, abundant, infinite love, then I want to go back to that. So how do you how do you get the mind to calm down and to allow this other reality that exists to show itself? Well, one way is to use this brainwave entrainment audio technology, but and that helps to quiet the mind. Uh, but I want to speak to more than just that. Um, this idea of placing attention on the heart and feelings is incredibly powerful. And, you know, you said something how you don't cry a lot. And I would say that that's a very uh, common thing in the Western world, because we're taught, don't show your emotions, you know, whatever generation you're in, it might be a little different, but we're taught to kind of be, be brave and strong out in the world. And so we suppress our emotions. And, and then when we, just like you, when I started paying attention to the heart and in a different way, I was doing Sufi heart rhythm meditation, breathing, uh, breathing in patterns related directly to my heartbeat. And the, as I did this, I had a similar thing, crying and tears. And what is this? I, I, don't, I don't feel lonely normally, but oh my gosh, this incredible feeling of despair. And so you have to go through that work. But the same thing happened to me once I released all that, I was rewarded. I released all of that and it was replaced with this other feeling, very similar to what you described where, no, I'm not alone. I have this huge spiritual energy that's here to support me. I only have to pay attention to it. So you need to find a technique similar to what we've described where you move out of your head. It may be different from one person to the next, exactly the formula, you know, when I would go to workshops, sometimes the techniques we were taught didn't do so much for me, but other people were having a great time. But eventually I did find the techniques that worked for me. And uh, it just takes some trial and error. For some, it might be dance. For some, it might be uh, journaling. You know, there's all kinds of ways to sort of get out of your head and into this feeling state, this energy of oneness that, as you say, is available to us if only we pay attention and find that yeah. awareness. So Evan, I wanna talk about the science because in the previous segment, you were talking about turning the volume down and then turning the volume up on the different parts of your brain. Do you think that this is, there's a relationship? So, you know, when you're listening to um, the brainwave music, what about it helps it, like what's happening on the brain, the neuroscience behind it that allows you to, your mind to relax? Well, it's, it's something um, that I would say is still not uh, very well understood, and we, we discuss it a bit in our book, Living in a Mindful Universe. The general idea is that, uh, and this goes back two centuries to when it was first discovered, but putting a pure tone into one ear and a slightly different, say, something that varies by a few cycles per second, four or six, eight cycles per second, um, in the other ear, and then somewhere in the brain, you get this wavering sensation. And that seems to be the really powerful part of it. And the wavering is coming because uh, what's happening is those sounds are being measured and interpreted in a, a nucleus down in the lower brainstem. It's called the superior oliveri nucleus. Um, and I will re remind people that other slow left-right oscillations in the lower brainstem uh, have been used to engender transcendental conscious states. For example, hip hypnosis, you know, a, a visual target slowly oscillating in front of the eyes and the eyes follow that. That is using that same lower brainstem region mm -hmm. in left-right oscillations to change consciousness. Likewise with EMDR, you know, eye movement desensitization and reprocessing, which is often used to treat um, post-traumatic stress disorder, it similarly is using the midbrain in a circuit to go back and forth like that. Mm -hmm. So the reality is I believe that the, the tones create a very kind of powerful endogenous left-right oscillation signal down there that from my point of view, 
homogenizes the ascending signals coming from the reticular activating system. Mm -hmm. I don't want to get into a big neuroscience lecture, but the bottom line is the general notion in neuroscience uh, conventional is that you've got uh, consciousness being the result of all the actions in the neocortex. Mm -hmm. That's the outer surface of the brain. You know, if you took off my skull, you'd see the outer surface. That's the neocortex. That's the part that makes us human. Um, and that that is being kind of modulated by these ascending signals that come up 40 times per second from these lowest regions of the brainstem. And I believe what's happening is with sacred acoustics and similar binaural beat brainwave entrainment, you're simply modulating those ascending signals. Interesting. And given that it's such an ancient circuit, it arose more than 300 million years ago, uh, you know, far older than the normal circuits that interpret sound in our acoustic cortex. Uh, I believe that's one of the reasons why it can enable such a profound kind of liberation of conscious uh. awareness from the uh, kind of sense of self and sense of here and now. And that's why um, it enables indie ears, for example, to get back into that same territory in a very mm. robust fashion. Okay, I just got super excited because um, I'm learning, um, I'm also taking a class, <laughs> I love taking classes, but I'm taking a class on, um, on um, Tumo and, and, um, and Tantra. There are all these different types of techniques and they um, speak of a red channel. And I'm going to, and uh, apologies for, for any uh, pronouns that are inaccurate or that offend anyone, but the red channel is considered a female channel or has the feminine attributes and the left channel is considered the um, masculine. And then with the meditation, you're trying to take these two channels and then um, at your downtown or near your belly button, you're trying to merge them together to go back up the central channel. And I'm wondering whether, you know, this back and forth movement is in fact another oneness between female and male energies that are, you're kind of forcing it to go back up into the central channel and creating some call it a kundalini experience oneness I, i'm wondering if that's what's happening is that a far stretch i don't think it is a far stretch because i think there's a lot of these kind of techniques out there yoga nidra is another one where if you're you, that's when where you're in the shavasana laying down position. You're not moving around, but you're guided to move your awareness from the left side to the right side of your body over and over again. Oh. And so I think this uh, idea of identifying the masculine and feminine parts of you sort of separately and then recombining them is a beautiful way to sort of enact that feeling of oneness. And uh, there's a lot of ways to do that. And, uh, you know, the left, right, pranayama breathing, they have a left, right channel. And maybe that's another thing. I will say that just for your lay people, anything that has a, uh, which is most of us, anything that has a wah, 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 wah sound, that's what he means by wavering sound. Mm. And so that contains a binaural beat. So if you're used to listening to brass bowls, crystal bowls, uh, gongs, they have a natural binaural beat in them. And that's what I first started listening to that really helped me to quiet the mind was crystal uh, bowls can be so mesmerizing. And while they emit that sort of wah, wah in whatever frequency, it's a binaural beat. I learned uh, this just through uh, the audio engineer who's my co-founder of Sacred Acoustics. He started analyzing this kind of music mm. and found, oh my gosh, there's natural binaural beats in there. So mm. it's no wonder that lots of Eastern folks use these kinds of bowls to get people into these states, just to kind of get to that uh, starting off point. Oh, that's fascinating. Okay. Um, that's super fascinating. Okay, Evan, um, one other question related to this wobbling that you, that Karen just spoke about um, do you think it's the right and left brain that are being, because in, in, in pranayama, you're trying to like, you know, merge the two right and left part of your brain. Do you think that that's also what's happening that kind of calms down the mind so that it can kind of, you know, get to this kind of oneness place? Um, do they have any information about activating the right and left parts of the brain when Well, I think in essence, what you're really trying to do is take the brain out of the way. And so mm. in other words, you're, you're in many ways trying to neutralize any differences between left and right 
hemisphere. And I, I feel that by going to this very low and ancient uh, brainstem center that we're talking about, that naturally enables you to, uh, to uh, basically escape from the kind of dualisms and the material aspect of the physical brain and the physical universe and body. Mm. Uh, and that's where we get outside of space and time with these kind of adventures. That's what, um, uh, you know, remote viewing is all about doing exactly that. And it's not necessarily locked in a, in a here and now. But keep in mind that all of these are mental techniques, all yeah. of them. And so we can use, this just shows how we can use our mind to cultivate these kinds of experiences through these different sorts of visualizations, whether it's masculine, feminine, left, right, you know, black, white, whatever it is, we're bringing those dualities back together. So some of us are gonna respond to different symbolism uh, more readily than others, just depending on how we've been raised, what we relate to, what sparks that interest in us. But yeah, it's all about bringing that duality back together. Yeah, and I like one that. One other thing I'd add is um, that uh, in many ways, the, the uh, binaural uh, beat brainwave entrainment uh, is simply a way of returning to kind of unity consciousness. Mm. Uh, and it's and the important piece for your listeners is that modern neuroscience looks at the brain not as a producer of consciousness, but as a filter that allows in primordial consciousness. So we're, we're basically saying that consciousness is something that exists. And, and in fact, the entire universe throughout all of its history has existed within consciousness, not the other way around. And, <laughs> and when you flip it and start to realize that that makes the most sense, because it certainly fits the data, then uh, when we're talking about this meditation and, and what we're doing with the brain, what we're really talking is just traversing across that veil and coming into direct contact with the universal mind and primordial consciousness. Mm -hmm. And that is essentially what I believe is happening. And that's what opens up our free will uh, tremendously. And that's where things like placebo effect, which is a beautiful example of mind over matter, uh, can come into full power when we gain this kind of access to primordial mind and manifest the free will of our higher souls in determining our course in this world, as opposed to um, following our little ego mind and its little use of fear and anxiety and assuming that's all that involves us as a soul in this journey. There's much more to it. And this is about expanding that sense of self. I love it. Okay, we've been talking to... Um... Eben um, Alexander and Karen Newell um, about their book, Living in a Mindful Universe. And they will be coming on March 6th. Well, they will be presenting online March 6th from one to five at the eastwestbookshop.com. So please sign up for their class. Thank you so much.